Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration and information on writing, publishing options and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint and lots more information at thecreativepen.com and that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 546 of the podcast and it is Friday the 16th of April 2021 as I record this. In today's show, Mark Leslie Lefebvre and I discuss his new book, Wide for the Win, and our tips for a more relaxed approach to writing and publishing without the hamster wheel of uh, rapid release and uh, ads. And of course, Mark and I always have a banter. So hopefully it's a fun lesson and you will get some ideas for your own author business. So that's coming up in the interview segment. In publishing news, well, the big news this week was the announcement of Kindle Vella, a new way to publish serialised stories on Kindle and only open to US authors at the moment. Now, of course, those of us who've been around a while remember Kindle Serials, uh, launched in 2012. And I particularly remember Sean Platt and David Wright, um, two of the three at Story Studio with Johnny B. Truant. And uh, the Story Studio podcast, of course, is, is fantastic too and they used to do the self-publishing podcast so uh, we've all been around a while obviously they've all been on the show as well a number of times many of you know Sean and Dave and Johnny anyway back in 2012 they did Z2134 which was a, a zombie thing and essentially they did it through the Kindle serials but a couple of years later, pretty much Kindle wound up Kindle serials and Z2134 is available as a full book, but it was written as a serial and the guys did a lot of serials in those early days. And then what happened was... it. It just wasn't a way that a lot of people consumed. But this is a very Western thing, I think, because in Asia, certainly serialised fiction is huge and has been huge for a long time. And these are sort of micro micro episodes on uh, smartphone apps or, you know, phone apps that people consume little bite sized chunks of. And some of them have been going on for years and years. Now, Wattpad has obviously been going on for more than a decade. A lot of people have been successful on Wattpad pad and that is similar it's a serialized writing and reading app and uh, that was bought earlier this year by South Korea's Naver which owns Webtoon and they have millions of users and of course China literature is is sort of the big the big name and there's web novel web novel Uh, other sites include Tapas and Radish so I think what's happened here is that this way of reading is moving into the West, although we're probably about a decade behind, to be honest, with this kind of reading. And I feel like maybe Sean and Dave and Johnny were too early in 2012. So either this is going to go really, really well, and it will become a new way to publish, um, or... China literature. I mean, the timing of this is kind of hilarious. I mean, it's it's obvious. I mean, China literature are moving into the US market at the moment. They've announced they are moving into North America and they want to recruit 100,000 authors to their platform. And so I, f- I kind of feel that Kindle Vela is to head off lots of people heading over to China literature and very, very interesting times, I think. Now, first of all, and the new publishing standard goes into this in much more detail, so links to that in the show notes. But the thing is, if you're listening to this and you already read serial books and you already write in a serial manner, then this could be awesome for you. This could be a new way of writing, publishing and making income either with China Literature or with Kindle Vela, whatever you decide. And I haven't read their contract, so you're going to have to read the contract and decide whether it's worth it. But uh, I am not a serial fiction reader or writer. I am one of those people who buys an in. I, I expect in my books, I want the book I love to read and the books I write. I want an end-to-end story with very clear closure and that's what I like to read. (laughs) And what's funny is, you know, I'm super super open-minded I think about a lot of things and you know excited about all kinds of tech and things. But in terms of the books I read, many of us as fiction readers particularly 
Uh, I'm less so with non-fiction. I'll read all over the map. But with with fiction, I like a, a book and I like it to end in a certain way. And I get quite disappointed <laughs> if, a, say, a thriller or a fantasy or whatever ends in a way that I don't find satisfying. And for me, this idea of serials, it's it, it's just not something I want to read or write. So I would suggest that you only consider going down the serial route if you do read this way, because I think it will be very hard to be successful in this manner if you don't understand what the uh, readers want. You cannot adapt a previously published book for Vela, which I think is probably a good idea because I don't think that's the way these stories work. Um, in fact, it's quite interesting because um, in terms of people like Charles Dickens, his work was serialised and he used to write for serials, uh, obviously print magazines back in the day, print newspapers and stuff like that. So obviously it is a certain way of writing that will suit some people. And I guess some of his books are so long, Dickens books, because they were written in in that way and people didn't read the whole book at once, <laughs> like we're forced to in English literature. So yes, in terms of the readers, they can start reading for free and then they buy tokens and these tokens will translate into revenue for authors but as I said definitely go read the contract if you just search for Kindle Vela or um, I will link to it in the show notes. They uh, readers can offer feedback along the way so if you've used Wattpad you'll know people can comment they can like they can uh, do all these different things and it looks like Vela will be the same and again if you like that type of thing awesome if you don't yeah it's going to be a social app and, and as, as I said, in Asia, the most successful serial authors write stories that go on for a long time, as in years. It's not like, OK, my book will take 12 serial chunks to finish and then it will be done. This definitely suits that kind of longer, longer story. People who, who write really good cliffhangers or, you know, can can get people involved. So, yeah, very interesting, I think. And uh, some of you, I'm sure, will get into that. So you'll be hearing a lot more about serial uh, writing and reading. Also, several people have emailed me about commenting on Microsoft buying Nuance, who own Dragon, uh, make Dragon Dictate, which many authors use for dictation. And I did see this uh, and I, to be honest, I thought not much of it because I think the way dictation and the way voice tech has been going, as I've talked about many times, is that there's pretty much dictation apps on every single platform now native into the platform you use. So whether you use uh, Windows or you use Mac or you get a free app on your phone, you can use your watch, your smartwatch if you have one, you can use uh, all kinds of things to dictate now and the transcription is getting better and better. I mean my mum just uses the native dictation in Google Docs like it's free for her so go to tools voice typing and you can just type uh, in and a lot of this stuff is getting very, very good. There are also lots of services. So obviously Descript, which I use for editing this podcast, Trint, Otter. There are lots and lots of services now. And so I kind of think that Microsoft has bought Nuance Dragon. I mean, they might keep it running as a separate app or they might just put it into their Microsoft suite of tools. So yeah, but I, I definitely saw Dragon sort of facing a, a downward spiral as these voice tech apps become cheaper, free and better over time. So yeah, voice tech is moving very fast. So whatever system you have already will likely have a dictation option. But of course, many authors do still use Dragon and uh, that can be a way to do dictation. In my personal updates, uh, I'm definitely researching and writing on the Shadow Book, which is a longer term project. So you'll hear me keep talking about that for a while. And I'm not rushing it. It means a lot to me personally. And I'm delving into a lot of my own journals and uh, thoughts and things. So I'm going to take my time with that one. I have also been doing inventory management, <laughs> which is uh, normally used for physical inventory. And of course, we do have physical. I don't keep any inventory as in I don't keep books in stock in my house but obviously we all have inventory we have our books and updating older books with new back matter checking links and that piece of work I've been you know if you if you order your book so I have a folder on my um computer called vellum and in it are all my files that I've generated from vellum 
over time. And what I do periodically, like this week, I sort by reverse date and anything that's sort of older than two years, I open up the file and inevitably after two years, you need to fix the back matter. And maybe there are some links within that need changing or adding or whatever. So I've done a bit of that this week, (laughs) which is painful, but necessary. And also very fun, fun in inverted commas, it is not fun, is at the creative pen dot com you will see I have a new theme if you ever go to the website of course and many of you don't you listen to the show you don't need to go to my website but if you go to the creative pen.com I now am using authority pro from studio press and I haven't changed my theme in about eight years and I'm only doing it because the header was causing some causing some speed issues with the Google update that's coming in May for page experience and core web vitals so I wanted to tell you guys that I've changed my theme because you might find if you visit the site something weird and I might not have spotted it. So if you do find anything weird or uh, that needs fixing, please email me joanna at thecreativepen.com as it will no doubt no doubt take a bit of time for things to bed down and me to get everything right. Everything should be working. I have tested this on a staging site and what's funny is I'm recording this before I do the work on production. <laughs> So uh, I hope that when this goes out on Monday, it will all be fine. Again, I kind of call this inventory management too. We all have to do these necessary things over time. Yes, we always are working on new books and new aspects of marketing, uh, like this episode of the podcast. This is a new episode, but you also have to maintain your existing catalogue and your existing assets. You have to look after your books. You have to look after your website. For example, I still see authors who have not sorted out their HTTPS. They're still on HTTP. And this is a ranking factor and you will be suffering in your Google rankings. And it's not a big deal. I know. I remember when uh, I did it and I just paid someone to do it. It didn't take very long. It's not a biggie. Many um, web hosts will sort it out for you. You you might just need to click a button. But um, yes, moving from HTTP to HTTPS is is like one example. But uh, the world tends to entropy. This is one of those things like we walk along. Obviously, I've been walking along a canal a lot in the last year with the pandemic. And we see the canal boats that are there. And in outside of the pandemic, they always had to move. So they they were moving a lot more and you would see different boats. But a lot of the boats have been, have stayed still for the pandemic. They haven't moved on, the the rules changed, whatever. And you see some of these boats, just the, the tendency to entropy when something sits in water is just classic, you know, this sort of slow disintegration into rotten ruin, basically. And the same thing happens, this sort of gradual decline into disorder, unless we manage things over time. This is Uh, necessary occasional pain to keep everything running. And this is the same for maintenance of your house, maintenance of your physical body, your health. If you let things slide for too long, it all falls apart. (laughs) So you have to look at this stuff. So my question for you this week, do you have books that you haven't looked at for a couple of years? Do you need to update the back matter? Does the text need updating? Uh, It might not be an entirely new edition, just a new updated file, for example. Does your website need a look at? Are you on HTTPS? What really needs to be done? So what is necessary? So for me, I this is a necessary thing for the creativepen.com in order for my site to continue ranking well in Google for various search terms. So I need to do it. I have thought about it for ages, but now I really need to do it. Uh, what might put more money in your pocket? And uh, what can wait? So is it a vanity metric or is it truly an important thing to do? So for example, I consider updating my back matter with my new books and uh, say adding some new affiliate links into my nonfiction. That's That will put more money in my pocket. So I'm going to spend the time and, and the pain and the few hours it takes to update this type of thing uh, is necessary. But we all have to consider what is necessary. Also on my books and travel podcast this week, I talked to nature writer Tiffany Francis Baker about exploring darkness and accepting our animal selves. Again, completely technology to nothing about technology. My books and travel show is very focused on 
completely different things. So if you want to escape into the night (laughs) and tap into the cycles of the natural world in order to feel better and rest more and experience the world in a different way. And we also talk about pagan fire festivals and the Northern Lights. I can't help a pagan fire festival discussion. So go have a moment of escape at the Books and Travel podcast on your favourite app. In Useful Stuff, the Six Figure Authors podcast this week, Lindsay and Joe talk about ways to use bonus material to sell more books. Lots of ideas for fiction authors, including short stories, novellas, prequels, second epilogues, bonus scenes, short audio and more. And this is essentially what I term content marketing for fiction authors. So fiction authors are like, oh, content marketing means you have to do blogging or podcasting. But no, it doesn't. Content marketing is giving stuff away for free in order to attract people to sign up for your email list or buy your books. And this is what Lindsay and Joe talk about. Uh, fiction that you can give away in order to sell more books. And Lindsay actually says that these freebie stories and bonus scenes and all this stuff have been better marketing than advertising over her what, decade, at least, of being a writer. So yeah, definitely check that out. Six Figure Authors, episode 86 on bonus material. Also on book marketing, BookBub have a good list of ways authors are promoting their books in 2021. And the BookBub blog is very good. Uh, I, I always have a look at that. The article includes promoting perma-free first in series as reader magnets over the long haul, which is the same type of thing as Lindsay and Joe are talking about and is the cornerstone of my fiction marketing. Stone of Fire has been free for many, many years and brings people into my uh, fiction. Uh, also, the BookBub Um, articles covers promoting audiobooks to diversify income, which is definitely made easier by Chirp, which you can get into if you publish wide through Findaway Voices. And other tips include smart branding, creating resources for educators, joining forces with other authors, bookstagramming, and even TikTok, which I'm going nowhere near, even though several of you have emailed me and said, oh, you know, you should really try TikTok. No, I'm still a Twitter girl. (laughs) And finally, do you write action adventure uh, or fantasy adventure or anything that involves adventure, uh, fast paced stories that hunt for things? That's usually what we talk about. So my arcane series is action adventure. My map walker series are fantasy adventure. And of course, you know, if you read Clive Cussler and uh, people like indies like Nick Thacker, David Wood, Kevin Tumlinson and many more, we are doing an Adventure Writers Summit. Now, this was great great fun last year and um, discussions of Indiana Jones and Lara Croft and lots of books that we recommend in terms of action adventure. There's lots of um, talks on different things like how to write a good good MacGuffin, (laughs) which if you write action adventure, you'll know all about the MacGuffin. And uh, it is free and you can also uh, pay a little bit to get the recording at thecreativepen.com forward slash adventure summit that redirect should go to the summit and it is april 23rd to 25th 2021 which is this coming weekend i know it's short notice but (laughs) the guys are just sorting it out but it was really fun last year and you get to hang out live with some awesome authors and uh talk about writing adventure so if you write adventure or you're considering it go along to thecreativepen.com forward slash adventure summit So thanks for your emails and tweets and comments this week. Jacqueline Rowe says, I am so excited about this podcast with Crystal. I finally have a great resource to encourage writers looking to self-publish children's books. Yay, you're the best. Uh, Yeah, Crystal was fantastic. Uh, Lee says, listen to the podcast with KM Wyland, which was uh, last year's uh, On My Run in the Forest on this beautiful day. First time listener. Inspiring. Welcome, Lee. And thank you for the lovely picture. Uh, E.B. Adams said, I like that Crystal mentioned YouTube. And I think this was a comment on YouTube, actually. It will be more important for children's authors as more kids are growing up watching than reading. And that's absolutely true. Maybe that's another idea for repurposing illustrations, animate them for video. E.B. also said, my illustrations on my first couple of books make me cringe looking back, but it was probably the best investment in my career as I have the easiest illustrator to work with myself. And uh, basically, E.B. said, uh, invest some time in learning to draw. It is possible to get good enough a lot quicker than most people think. That's very interesting. Didn't even consider that. 
Uh, Vesta Giles said, so much in this. I'm just about to release my first chapter book and I made sure I did a work for hire contract. Plus the notes at the beginning. I need more paper to make notes when I'm listening to this. I think you mean the intro to the show. Glad you enjoyed it, Vesta. And then I also wanted to share this comment from Alex Hallett, who said, loved everything about the interview apart from the work for hire recommendation for using illustrators. No self-respecting illustrator transfers the copyright of their images. This kind of rights grab can lead to exploitation. It is like the worst kind of publishing contract. So thank you, Alex, for tweeting this. This is on Twitter. This is a very good point and brings up this tension. If you are a creator, so whether you write, like most of you guys are writers, but some of you are also artists or illustrators or voice artists or whatever, you have to decide what you do with your intellectual property. So yes, when you create something, that is your intellectual property. You get to decide the contracts you want to sign. There is always a tension. So many of you have signed traditional publishing contracts that might include the clause worldwide English, all formats existing now and to be invented for the life of copyright. And that clause is very pervasive in the publishing industry. Now, you get to choose whether you want to sign that clause or negotiate it. The tension there is the publisher wants all the rights they can get. The author doesn't want to give away all the rights. So you get to negotiate. Okay. The same with the illustrator. So um, Alex, I'm certainly not saying, and Crystal even said, you might have to pay a lot more to get that kind of contract because the illustrator has said, all right, I'll do that. But only if you pay me three times my normal rate, for example, you get to decide what you want. So being an independent creator means that you are empowered to sign the contract you want to sign and you have to decide where the tension is. So Alex, I think that the main thing, and obviously this podcast is not primarily aimed at illustrators or, um, you know, people who do visual art, but the, exactly the same principle applies. You get to be empowered about your contracts and authors are. And uh, what's so funny now, of course, is a lot of indie authors are moving into publishing other people and they are creating contracts. And suddenly there's this tension again between what rights you want to um uh, license and what the author wants to license. So this is, this is a really good example. And so thank you, Alex, for reminding us of the importance of understanding the contract and only signing the things you want to sign or deciding what will make it worth it. So to be honest, if I write a book, let's say I write a story next year, I'm going to write a novel. It's going to be a standalone horror novel. Now, if I get offered a big chunk of cash, for, I will sign that clause. I will probably sign that clause. I do have a figure in my head for which I would sign the clause. And you have to think the same way. You have to be like, okay, is it worth it for me? I will I will go into this with my eyes wide open. That's the main thing. Right, so today's show is sponsored by Kobo Writing Life and I'll play a word from Tara and Steph in a minute. Just to say that I have sold nearly, I'm just about to cross over 50,000 ebooks across 166 countries through Kobo since joining the platform and Kobo Writing Life is an integral part of my wide publishing approach. I highly recommend going direct to Kobo Writing Life and have a listen to episode 539 if you want some more in-depth tips on selling more on Kobo. So this type of corporate sponsorship pays for the hosting, transcription and editing. But my time in creating the show is sponsored by my lovely patrons. And yes, I really need to do the Patreon Q&A this week. It is coming. Thanks to new patrons in the last week, Shannon Morgan, Michael Thomas and Kimberly Schramm or Scram, which is an awesome name. Thanks to everyone supporting the show on Patreon. It means so much to me. Um, It means more and more to me, really. And uh, you are in the book, How to Make a Living with Your Writing. I say thank you to all all my patrons, you're brilliant. You can support the show with a couple of dollars or euros or pounds or Canadian dollars a month, uh, a coffee a month or a couple of coffees if you're feeling generous and you'll get that extra monthly Q&A audio where you get to ask your questions or and you also get the backlist so you get lots more audio. You can support the show at patreon.com, p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash the creative pen. Right, here's a word from Kobo Writing Life and then we'll get into the interview. Hi, I'm Stephanie. And I'm Joni. And we're from Kobo Writing Life, Kobo's free, fast and easy self-publishing platform. 
KWL was built by authors for authors, and our team of dedicated book lovers are always working hard to help authors reach new readers around the world. With that in mind, we want to tell you about Kobo's subscription reading service, Kobo Plus. This program has been a great success in the Netherlands and Belgium, which is why we decided to bring it to our home market and launch Kobo Plus in Canada. The great thing about Kobo Plus for authors is that it reaches an entirely new audience who may be trying digital reading for the first time. We also ensured that authors retain control of their books. Do you want to try out a book in Kobo Plus in Canada, but not in the Netherlands? You have the option to do that. Simply select the areas you want to be included in the rights and distribution section of your book. My favorite feature for authors is that there's no exclusivity with Kobo Plus. You can sell your books wherever you choose, and we encourage you to make your work available to as many readers as possible. It's a great way to gain and build an audience. If you want to learn more about Kobo Plus or Kobo Writing Life, check out our blog, podcast, and find us on social. You can create your free account at kobo.com slash writing life. Back to you, Joanna. Mark Leslie Lefebvre writes horror stories, travel books, and nonfiction for writers. He's a podcaster at Stark Reflections on writing and publishing, a professional speaker, and a publishing consultant at draftadigital.com. His latest nonfiction book is Wide for the Win, Strategies to Sell Globally via Multiple Platforms and Forge Your Own Path to Success. Welcome back, Mark. Hey, Joe. Thank you so much. And thanks for reading that keyword-laced subtitle that I made there. (laughs) Yeah, it's, it's a good long one there. That's excellent. And in fact, I learned that be, from you. Hey, well, that can be our first tip when writing nonfiction. <laughs> Wide for the win actually makes no sense to anyone who's not in our area, but the subtitle makes it clear. So good tip straight up. <laughs> but, but let's get into it because you've been on the show so many times. People have heard you on lots of other podcasts, including your own. But let's talk about the book. So why this book now? You and I have been talking about this for probably a decade. <laughs> so <laughs> why, why Wide for the Win now? And why is it such an exciting time to be wide? Well, I think because, I mean, the, the, and this goes back to why I, I wrote Killing It on Kobo all those years ago, is when you go out and look in the, in the market, there are thousands of books about writing and hundreds and hundreds of books about self-publishing. And all of them are uh, Kindle this, Kindle that, Kindle the other thing. And, and, and yes, Amazon is the world's biggest bookstore. And yes, it's a great platform, but there's nothing on the other platform. So why for the win is the whole idea is a uh, focus on other platforms, uh, as well as Amazon, but just being inclusive. And, and I think that's the, the, the most difficult thing for authors is recognizing, uh, yes, Amazon is the world's biggest bookstore. And yes, that's probably where you started because it made the most sense, right? Because you can't learn them all at once. And so how do you deal with wide? And, and it's not just here are tactics you can use if you're publishing direct on Kobo or Nook or, or whatever, or here are some things you can try. There is that but they're going to change over time and they're always going to change. So I think I actually owe this a lot to you as I was talking to you, as I was getting frustrated trying to write the book that was going to be a lot more tactical and, and, and leveraging really great examples from phenomenal people, like from the wide for the win Facebook group who are sharing every day, some amazing tactics and strategies and personal anecdotes and stories. And I think I was, you know, I'd already pushed the publication date back twice as we were scheduling to do this interview around the time of the launch. And it was kind of like, so Joe, I pushed it back another month. And we we chatted and, and you'd suggested mindset is the biggest hurdle. It's not the tactics. It's not those strategies. They're going to come and go. You know, earth abides. <laughs> tactics come and go, but mindset abides is what I would say in, in honor of George R. Stewart's, uh, you know, classic novel. And obviously that f- phrase from the Bible. But so I think. I think it's important because that mindset hurdle is probably one of the most significant things that are stopping authors from being successful wide. And let me explain that just a little bit. A lot of authors just put their books up wide and then expect the same way they would expect, oh, I have a publisher. They're going to do stuff for me, right? In the indie author space, it's like, oh, I've published it to Google and I've published it to Apple. Well, now they're going to take care of selling it for me. I'm just going to go back and recommend everyone go to Amazon and buy my book. And so it's kind of like teaching people to publish wide is not just putting your books up on other platforms. It's actually engaging with the communities, engaging with the platforms and engaging with your book on those platforms. So you understand it the way you understand it, Amazon, uh, which again, it's not easy. There's no simple, Oh, just could do these three things and you'll be successful. And so I think it's important because thanks to you, 
almost 50% of the book is mindset over specific strategies and tactics. Because, I mean, as I was writing the book, yeah, I listened to one of the episodes of your podcast and went, oh, I should talk about this thing that I haven't talked about. Like Joe just made me, oh, yes, think of the future, Mark. <laughs> Don't just think of the past. And it, I mean, a lot of that is, and you and I were at, I think, that conference with uh, Dean Wesley Smith and Christine Catherine Rush learning about IP and that whole focus of that Vegas workshop. I mean, that was a that was a significant game-changing moment for me. It's something I, I always had in the back of my mind. I always knew, okay, multiple formats, multiple platforms, but even taking it way outside of book in terms of IP and understanding this is your intellectual property. And you've been an advocate for all the formats and all the things you can do. And I tried to help authors by see, you know, I'm not going to get into specific details of how to work with Hollywood or how to sell game rights or how to do whatever, but I want to open their minds to the possibility so they don't sign contracts with platforms or publishers or whatever that are going to limit their ability to grow. So I think, I think it's just that mindset is just so critical. Yeah, I think it's interesting. And I mean, I, let's be very clear, you said it up front, but why publishing wide doesn't exclude Amazon. There's I, what I don't like is this a burgeoning dichotomy. It's not KU or Amazon versus wide. Right. The whole ethos of wide is everything published, yeah. everything. In fact, I was actually just thinking earlier today, if only like I would accept lower royalties on Amazon to have my books in KU as long as they were non-exclusive. And I, I, I if they did that, like I'd take half the rate or whatever maybe I shouldn't yeah. say that but in public but I feel like I three want quarters. to yeah three quarters <laughs> but I want to be in KU but I do not want to be exclusive so right. I think and and in fact I am in KU my mum's books are in KU is yeah. Penny Appleton and my German books I have four books in German they right. are all in KU and I feel because they're in KU because I don't have the ability to market multiple brands actively like I do with Joanna Penn and JF Penn. So that's the first thing. We're not saying you can't do everything. You just can't do everything with one book. You can't be simultaneously in KU and Y, but you can do it across your catalogue. And so that's, I think, a really important point. And then also, as you said, wide is not just about ebooks on KU or not, it's also about format. So we're going to talk about print and audio. It's yeah. also about country. So you're in Canada, I'm in the UK. It's also about not just the USA. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it's also about language, as I've mentioned, German. It's about all these different things. And as you said, it's also about long term. It's not just money. Uh, in fact, you and I, as we record this, I launched a book two weeks ago, that How to Make a Living, the third edition. And someone emailed me. They said, oh, you know, did, how did your launch go? I saw you hit the Amazon bestseller list on Amazon.com briefly, but it wasn't there very long. And I was like, yeah, but I sold like a couple of thousand dollars direct in one day. And that money went in my bank account. <laughs> Immediately almost, right? Like through yes. the pay, pay hip to strike right? It's like a day or two later, it's in your bank account. What? What? Like within a couple of hours. <laughs> yeah. and, and this is another thing. It's like, yeah, sure, that didn't populate anyone's algorithm, didn't populate Apple's algorithm or Google's. Populated whatever. your pocketbook. Yeah, populated my <laughs> bank account and my own algorithm, my email list and that type of thing. So that's, I guess, some initial sort of scene setting, I guess. Right. Yeah. So let's talk about some, I know we're not, we shouldn't be talking massively about tactics, but I do think that there are some <laughs> fundamentals that are important when you're thinking about this. Right. So where would you start in terms of positioning our books for wide success? So I think it depends on where you're coming from. Are you first publishing? Have you been publishing only exclusively to Amazon? Because there's going to be some different ways that you change that. I did an article for for the Alliance of Independent Authors, uh, which was basically an excerpt from the book on how to deal with that. Because I think uh, the thing that's really important is, so I'm, I'm going to assume people are exclusive to Amazon and they're looking for how to, how to where to start. The very first place to start is think of your readers and and remind them let them know, give them a heads up. If you've curated this list of people who expect to read for what they what they pretend or think is free on Kindle Unlimited, unlimited reading for a, you know one price, 
let them know you're leaving the program if you plan on leaving and give them heads up because these are people who love you and you want to care for them. You don't want to abandon your Amazon KU readers. Let them know because then they can grab your books and put them in their library and then you can earn money, KU money off it two years after you've been wide, which which is great, but you've helped them. But then let them know where they can, they'll soon be able to get. If you want any of my other books or whatever, they're going to be available uh, free through the libraries. You just, you know, it's gonna be a little bit less inconvenient, but now everyone can get my books for free. But then the other thing I recommend people do is, okay, so Amazon's world's biggest bookstore. We know that most people know about it. You've got the, the four other retailers, the big five, right? Amazon, Apple Books, Google Play, Kobo, uh, Rakuten Kobo, and then uh, Nook, b and Nook, which is only in the US. All the other ones are, are international and in, and in many, many countries. You're not going to be successful on all of the platforms once, and it's really overwhelming to understand them. So take the time to pick one. Maybe it's the one that you've actually explored and looked at and you have the free app or you have a reader uh, and actually interact as a customer and understand a little bit more about them. And and then you'll notice, for example, that there are are certain benefits to going direct with some of the platforms. There's certain options where you don't, you can't really not go direct with some of the platforms, Google Play, but because you still have to have a direct account regardless of whether or not you use a third party. You know, what, what are the benefits of the, the time saving uh, versus the, the 10% you would give up to go through a distributor? And, and just try to understand the different perks, the different pros and cons. And that's going to take a while. To, to yeah, I, I'm going to um, I actually think it's more important to spend some time on the actual storefront yeah. as a customer. Like, I feel like we overemphasize the back end too much, as in the upload of files and things. Whereas, actually, if you go to, for example, in Kobo, I always go to Kobo.ca or whatever the you know the Canadian yeah. store. Go yeah. Kobo.com and change it to the the little Canadian, Canadian. flag because yeah. that's Kobo is biggest in Canada. Yes, I've sold books now in 162 countries through Kobo, yes. <laughs> but most of those sales are in Canada. So yeah. if you go to the Canadian uh, store, and then the other one to which is kind of even more different I think is the Apple Books store and you because that is so heavily curated and I mean I I discovered when I spent I was like why am I not selling non-fiction books uh, in ebook on Apple. I sell audiobooks there. Why am I not selling ebooks, nonfiction ebooks? And basically, it's because their storefront does not have a suitable category for the books I write. And when I finally talked to an Apple person about it, they said, Yeah, we don't have enough. There aren't enough customers within that category for you to sell. And maybe this, this is true for your nonfiction books on Apple too. Is yes, that, it is. Yeah, yeah, and it's because they literally don't have a decent browse category for authorship. And well, you I have like, the top 12 fiction books and the top yes. 12 nonfiction. And there's very few nonfiction categories. There's nonfiction, exactly. Business. Book yes, memoirs. So, That's so it. this is so. This, but this is the thing, and I think this is a massive learning for me and for everyone. You cannot expect the same thing to happen on each store. So, for example, with Kobo, my biggest earnings are fiction box sets. So. That's where I make yes. my money yeah. on Kobo fiction box sets. And then obviously in, on Ingram Spark for print, my big money is in nonfiction print books. So that would be my first tip is before you even go, well, what are the intricacies of uploads? Look at the storefront of the stores you don't usually buy from and figure out yeah. what is your best angle for these different things and what would be the best way to play it so for example again you're not going to find like people who say oh well I'm not selling my YA urban fantasy with my girl with a fighting stance on Apple well go have a look at that Apple store there aren't any books that look like that right so this and I've told so many people coming out of KU the covers that might work on KU do not work on the Apple Store. What do you think about that from Kobo? Obviously, you've come out of Kobo. Do you think there is a certain look to a KU cover that perhaps sometimes you have to change in certain genres to work on different stores? That's a really good question. The only time I remember from my time at Kobo with that, that was more related to romance in the UK versus America, for example, right? Like, no, we don't need half naked guys and their and their pecs and their abs and stuff like that. We want a different style. 
But that was based on, because I was paying attention to the Kobo merchandisers in the UK working with WH Smith and what they would feature. And we go, but this is a great book and it's selling like crazy. They go, yeah, we're not going to feature that <laughs> because it's, it's not. And, 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 and this is the one thing we, and I know we've talked about this in the past. It's the one thing that Penguin Random House does well is they do have a cover unique to geo markets that are going to cue in with the sensibilities. And you're talking about that from a step back because you only have one cover. Shame, shame that there's only one cover, right, <laughs> for for the different geos. Although, you know, there are, there are technical ways around it with multiple ISBNs. Well, and so stuff, you could right? use it. I mean, I haven't even thought of doing this, but you could because I'm not in KU, but you could use a different cover for Apple than yeah. you do for for your KU urban like, fantasy. Yeah, like you do with box sets, right? So so mm-hmm. Apple refuses to accept uh, three-dimensional digital box set covers, right? So you have to have, and, to, and, and Kobo highly prefers them, but they'll still accept them because Kobo is like, yeah, 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 well, we sell books and, and it's going to sell a lot, so who cares? Let's put it in. <laughs> like, mm. But we would prefer to have it look nice. Whereas Apple, as we know, is is very much look and feel. And if it doesn't match exactly that that sort of methodology is like, yeah, we're not going to use it. So yeah, that's true. Like if if you can do that with digital box sets with a different cover, why can't you do it you know, for a Kindle Unlimited versus a, a wide book? Yeah, I, I'm lit- literally never thought of that before. But the other thing I think is... The other th- the, que- the other question getting you probably get this we're talking the day after your you know wife the win launch and I actually don't care about launches and I don't think this is just my age in the community I think it's because right. I'm wide because and in fact in the traditional publishing industry in 2020 67% of the income for publishers was backlist and for me putting that book out was not about the launch it's about making my backlist you know I needed to upgrade that book because it's been selling well for five years and I needed to upgrade my backlist in order that my backlist continues to sell now yes it was a new front list edition but I consider it backlist and I actually consider most I consider all my work to be long-term sales and I also think this is a wide attitude because KU you know people obsess around the algorithms and the 90-day cliff and all that and I don't think that's what we do and in fact it's much easier to sell books wide when they're older some cases because they have history they have rankings they have temperatures as i think uh, tara from couple writing life was on your show a few weeks ago talking and i was like yay she used the term temperature <laughs> because i used to hear the big data team at couple uh, use that all the time uh, that's how they refer to ranking and it's really interesting because that you talk about that because yeah and that and that's actually ironically if if i were to tell indie authors wow you're thinking like a traditional publisher when you're focusing on the launch because the 67% of traditional publishing revenue comes from backlist but 95% of all their marketing goes on front lists which is basically that silly 30 60 90 day window and I was like, well, gee, indie authors, you're acting like a big New York publisher. <laughs> that, that'll insult them and then they'll change. But you're so right about that because I'll give you an example. Like I released the book A Canadian Werewolf in New York in 2016 mm-hmm. with a cover that was not good for the audience. I was thinking, no, it's not urban fantasy because it's not urban fantasy enough. I needed a more literary cover. Yeah, I kind of did okay. I did some stuff. I redid all the covers for the series with branding, you know, with a with a, um, a, a artist who who did all of my covers for the series that are more online. And so I've probably sold more of that in the last six months than I have in the previous six years. Well, not six years; it was only five years. But for a few reasons, I mean, obviously because I finally followed my own advice and wrote books in a series. Oh, imagine that. <laughs> I, what I've been telling thousands of authors. Well, you got to get the... It's books. another good tip for wide. <laughs> yeah. And it still works at wide, but it's it's been a, an interesting process. And I go, this book is six years old, almost five, six years old. And I'm selling more of it than other books that I released more recently. Mm-hmm. And, and the reality is, and this goes back to a used bookstore that I, I loved growing up, Bay Used Books in Sudbury, Ontario, Canada. And they used to have a little stamp they would put inside their books and they would say, a book you've never read is a new book. Hmm. And that is so true when it comes to your books and ebooks, because what's going to happen is, Joe, you've built this long-term thinking backlist. And then somebody discovers one of your novels, Day in New York or something like that. And they go, oh my God, she's got, oh, and I can buy the, the, the box set and I can, oh my, oh, and there's audio, oh, a, a large print. I can buy, I can buy gifts for my, for my mom because she's going to love these. Like, 
all of a sudden, when the right fan comes along, the magic happens. Hmm. There is no magic bullet other than that long, hard work, planting all those lightning rods, putting in the work, putting in the backlist. And then when the right customer comes along, you really feel that. And and there's weird things where some, I, I know authors, this happens to them going, you know, I've been taking along, do, 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 do. And all of a sudden, for no reason at all, I sold every single one of my books on, on, on Nook. What happened? Well, you know what happened? The right customer found whatever it was you did to get them there, whether, whether it was a, you know, a book bob ad or it was a feature deal or a written word media, whatever you did, something happened. They saw it and lo and behold, they were the right person. Yeah. And it happened. Yeah. And I think this is the other thing. I feel that being wide is a bit more relaxed in that we have quite a lot of people in the Wide for the Win Facebook group who are like, yeah, I write one book a year or I write maybe two books a year. And I mean, I've written a few more this year, pandemic year. You know, what else are you going to (laughs) do? You couldn't go on 100 kilometer walks. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I I did go on 186 kilometer walk. But apart from that, (laughs) but I think... Because it's about the backlist, you can be more relaxed. So, in fact, there was a BookBub blog, which is a great blog, um, Jane Steen. And I'll, I'll, by the time yeah. this goes out, it will have been out a few weeks. But it was like, can you keep selling a perma free with a book with a BookBub feature deal or and or fe- oh, and or ads? And I'm like, well, of course you can, because that's what I've been doing for the last <laughs> seven years or whatever. And in fact, I did one on desecration, which is free at the moment, and it it got thirty six thousand downloads doing a book bub feature deal was and that a feature deal not an yeah. international but it was a... it was an international feature deal wow. and uh, in fact I did precisely what Jane had which is you know the cover was different to the last time I ran it wow. but it was so interesting because people are like well how do you get things moving on these other stores well that is one way and if you can't get a feature deal you can do the pay-per-click ads so this is my like my relaxed relax the relaxed author marketing tip which is <laughs> f- uh, free first in series with bookbub pay-per-click ads running permanently yeah. on the ebook and that's it <laughs> what do you what do you reckon <laughs> no i i love that i mean david's david gogren's book on bookbub yeah. ads is excellent is book. Mm-hmm. but again so think about what you would pay for a feature deal eight hundred dollars yeah the something like US, that yeah. right something like that so imagine you take the because because again you're doing that because and maybe if you're lucky you get one well, one a month you're not going to but <laughs> what, so you take one, the eight hundred dollars or something yeah. divide it by thirty do some, uh, spend some money, probably you got to spend about $50, maybe uh, trying some different things, finding your target uh, mar- audiences, and then doing a, a, a permanent, so uh, whatever it is, whatever you can afford, divide it by the number of days in a month, and then run that. And you're constantly feeding. So I mean, you're, yeah, I'm assuming your call to action at the end of the book is going to lead them to the next book, right? Yeah, it's like that a trilogy, that, yeah. That it's mm-hmm. good. And all of these things are in place. And that your series metadata is Solid. Um, those are those those work. The other thing that I think can work, and this is very tactic oriented, but I think it's going to be useful, is if you're publishing direct to Nook through BNN. If you can, if you're lucky enough to live in a territory that does allow that, Google Play for sure. Uh, they just, I mean, they've been improving and iterating on Google Play so much in the last year. I'm so <laughs> excited to see that. But I I did a thing where I made 20 of my books on Google Play. I just made a 75% off coupon and they even make a, an automatic landing page just for your books mm-hmm. automatically. You can do it yourself, self-serve. And, and what you can do is like, I'm new to Google Play. I'm going to be doing this with Sean Costello because we've never bothered to put his books up there. I publish his books for him. We're going to take all his books, load them in there, send his newsletter, say, hey, my books are now on Google Play. If you want to, and I'm, I'm not sure we're going to, we're probably going to do some uh, a few free coupon codes. Pick one for free and pick another one for 75% off just to try and get, because again, we know Google's very algorithmic based. Mm. If we can get a lot of customers doing some stuff, like recently I've gotten some really great action on Google Play with an international book, Bob. And obviously, thank you to the community of Wide for the Win readers who several people have bought that on Google Play uh, as well. So it's now feeding those algorithms and, and all mm. the things that you 
game Amazon for. <laughs> yeah, and I think uh, I've, there's actually an interview going out just before this one with Ryan, who's a product manager at Google, all about oh, Google Play. Oh, so, awesome. And yeah, you're going to love it too, because it talks about uh, AI voice, the stuff that's coming for audio. Uh, oh I, I knew my not, God, I, I can't wait to listen to it. Oh, you're going to be so excited. It's going to um, be weird because I'm in the future. And, yeah, and you're in the future. Out, so yeah, I'm you will go. have already listened to it. <laughs> oh, Joe, you know that last, last week's episode, Google Play? Oh my God, that was such an amazing uh, interview. Oh, but what's what's so interesting is he does talk about this algorithmic idea. And I found with Google Play, if you can just get things moving, like the difficult thing is getting things moving. And again, free booksy, bargain booksy, these are all good. But what I think is very, very important is coming back to this country idea yeah. is Android has something like nearly 80% of the smart mobile market in the world is Android. It's just that in the US and maybe in Canada, in the UK, iOS or Apple, you know, is dominant. Yeah. So people have this entirely skewed view of what the mobile experience is. Whereas in most other countries in the world, that's not how it is. So this is the other thing. I really want people to get this. You're reading... The way that you read is not the way that everyone else reads. Yeah. And I mean, let's come on to wide audio, for example. So obviously, Find Away Voices is our wide um, way in and Draft to Digital have a partnership with them. And they get you into 43 different distributors and there's libraries and there's all yeah. these things. But what's so fascinating with audio is I can't even fathom how many different ways people are listening to audio. And in fact, when Spotify comes on board, hopefully this year I really hope it happens this year they're now in they're rivaling um you know Kobo they're in 160 countries I think now with, yeah, with and they're, Spotify. They're, they're no slouch Spotify is well known <laughs> exactly and they're also yeah. algorithms so this is the other thing that yeah, algorithm powered but this is the big tip I think to everyone is you ha and in fact this is true of Amazon you have to get things moving and um let's talk about podcasting one of the ultimate uh international mediums you're a podcaster you're on a lot of different podcasts how do you think that's impacted your wide reach I honestly think and, and again so many of these things I learned from from you Joanna is the intimacy of audio is so critical the uh, the fact that you're connecting so through my podcast and through being on so many amazing podcasts and and again as a book guy as an industry guy but also as an author is just this amazing connection that people feel that they have with me and I, and I want them to have that I want to feel connected to people because I am I'm I'm a huggy touchy kind of not anymore guy. <laughs> <laughs> well not not uh, you know what I'm really suffering with the pandemic like Liz is like enough with the hugs already but I'm normally I'm, I would have been at a conference and I would have hugged a thousand people <laughs> she's like leave me alone but this is so critical and and what I learned about audio when I think about wide audio is Actually, Audible is probably my worst platform for audio income. I'm, I'm making money direct, and I'm making the most money through cost per checkout library. Huh. I remember looking at, like, when I was first with, with Findaway, because it was like all these platforms, you're like, yeah, whatever. It was kind of like Smashwords has the main ones, and then all these other places, and maybe you'll make a, a buck or two here once in a while, right? It was that kind of thing. I'm like, okay, I'll do the same thing. And I remember looking at going, who the heck is this? I've never heard of them. How come I made that much money off them? I've never heard of them. And and then I would reach out to Kelly or Will. <laughs> it was like, who are these people? What are they doing? Why am I selling so well? And and I love that about the white experience. When you, because I feel guilty that I don't know this platform that people are buying my stuff on. Because then, then I wonder. There's the part of me that says, as an author, I like to be part of the community. I want to I want to offer things. To my readers, I want to connect with them. I want to make sure that they feel. I, it's kind of like a, I'm the waiter. Is everything okay? Is the, do, you, do you need a refill? Like that's the kind of thing that I want to be. I want to make sure. It, very Canadian too. Can I apologize for something? Like that's the sort of thing. And so, the the joy of wide, the surprise of wide, is, is learning. Oh, I'm selling here. I didn't even know I was there. <laughs> like that's a, what a great place to be in, rather than. I mean, we do we do talk about focusing on and learning, but you're not going to learn all the platforms. But being on all the platforms uh, and being open to it is, I think, really, really a great place to start. And also that I find with podcasting, there are so many places that the, this podcast will be going out 
it on. And so you don't know where someone is listening. You know, I uh, encourage people to tweet me at the Creative Pen with pictures of where they're listening. And we do. We had someone even in Antarctica. Uh, yeah, he sent that. he sent a picture. And but who knows where what where they are in the world, where you are in the world listening right now, and where your favorite platform is that I might not even know. And that's the thing, like on Draft to Digital, on many of the other distributors, Publish Drive or whatever, you can't even count the number of yeah. places that might pick up these exactly. books. And and this is the other thing mm. I think, especially with Find a Way, uh, they're always adding new distributors. And you're like, well, I don't even know what that is, but it doesn't matter. And so I think this <laughs> this <laughs> it doesn't matter if, they, if they invested in the time in it. I bet you it's probably going to be worth it for something. Exactly. Right? And because I think this is the other thing. Let's talk about I'm, I might just you and I write a book called The Relaxed Author. We should. <laughs> We've had the healthy author. I should have jackets, you know, like some music in the background. Yeah. <laughs> because I feel like this is the thing. I don't care where you buy my books from. And I don't care what format you buy in because I'm going to have them available everywhere in all the formats. They're not available in all languages, but hey, we'll get there. Yes. And yeah, we're getting yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and in all the countries, although I did your laugh, I got Kobo to send me um, a list of the countries I was missing out of the 190. And oh, it, they, it, they did that for you. I'm, oh, that's great. <laughs> and I, I'm like, okay, I'm not sure I know how to reach those people. <laughs> but <laughs> but this is the thing. I think the the relaxed attitude is, look, I'm a writer, you know, we obsess about marketing, blah, blah, blah. But literally at the moment, all I'm doing is making sure my books are available everywhere. And then I'm running, I'm right. doing the podcast, obviously, and then I'm running these international ads and doing email and offering perma free and but really not spending that much time on it. And I feel like that's one of the gifts of wide is this. Yeah. In fact, Neil Gaiman talks about it, this, the um blowing on the what is it the little uh, puff ball thing where all the seeds go out oh it's, uh, that's exactly yeah yeah and yeah. then you don't know where they're going to land but some little seed might sprout somewhere that you didn't even know about and then you're like oh cool an extra 50 bucks this month or you know this happened or so I, I think that's how I feel about it really it's it's funny so you said a couple things that really st stuck home and, and I thought of an example so audio as an intimate intimate thing but also those seeds and you don't know how long like when you said we don't know when someone's listening to this either because i was at so I, thinking wide i'm at a local brewery where i purchased a table where i was selling print copies of my book because what where else am i going to be on a saturday anyways <laughs> In my little tent and somebody walks by and sees the original version of a canadian werewolf in new york on, on the front of my table and goes oh my god you're Mark Leslie. I remember listening to you on Paula B's The Writing Show podcast back in 2004 when you were talking about writing that book. <laughs> and, and so it's, it's kind of like more than 10 years later, somebody connected. She's like, I remember it because you were from Hamilton and, and I'm from Hamilton. And that was so cool that I was listening to someone from Hamilton. Guess, guess who bought a whole bunch of my books? And, and it was, okay, it was 10 years ago. It was like a, a minor thing, but I did two things that had nothing to do with selling ebooks on Amazon. <laughs> I was at a brewery with some print books and I was on a writing podcast in 2006 or 2005 or four or whatever. Mm. And all of these things came together. The seed got blown by enough pieces, <laughs> enough wind that all of a sudden that sale happened. And when you're wide and when you're thinking long-term and when you're thinking beyond the book and in multiple formats, that can happen with the right person at the right time because I maybe this I bet I bet you she's never read any book in her life because most yes. readers haven't. <laughs> so like being available like being available in large print, which is I, I know a strategy you use. There's there's a plenty mm -hmm. of people who go yeah, but every but every book on my Kindle or Kobo is a large print book. Yeah, yeah, but I don't read on that. So well, it's so, interesting. Even talking yeah. about print again, coming back to Ingram Spark, I in fact I gave up doing print back in 2014 or something, and then I got back into it in 2017 wow. when I was at Chris Rush and Dean Wesley Smith thing. Chris was like. <laughs> what do you mean you're not doing print? <laughs> I was like, oh, I feel stupid. I don't like to feel stupid in front of Chris. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go hide in the corner now. 
<laughs> yeah, I think I'll just go and sort my life out. Uh, and but what's so interesting is I had underestimated wide print, and what is it, forty three thousand distribution points that Ingram has. Right. But what's so crazy? So I was speaking in Sweden. And someone came up to me and they said, oh, look, your book's available on our print on demand store online, our online bookstore. And I'm like, oh, I didn't even know they were there because they were in the Ingram catalogue. They were distributed to those places or, you know, I was speaking in Australia and got books ordered and printed. And so I think, again, this is the attitude is if you are putting your catalogue, your intellectual property on all these places, you can just let them be and do the seed scattering uh, impact and see what happens, as you say, as long as you're in it for the long term. And I mean, we're almost running out of time. You and I could always talk about this forever. But look, I know it's so hard. People listening, if you're just starting out. So, Mark, I mean, you've been doing this now for like 25 years or something. <laughs> well, I first self-published in 2004. <laughs> but you were a bookseller you... Since 92. Yeah, since 92. Yeah. So yeah. you've been in the book world for this long. I feel like this is the biggest issue is the short term thinking. How can people how can people change that other than us going, you must think long term? How do we help people move on? Because I move into this longer term view, because I feel like it is the most dangerous thing, this obsession with why haven't I earned 10 grand a month in my first month of being an author? I think it goes back to a lesson from traditional publishing and my history with that world in in book selling is most authors would stick with an uh, stick with an author in in the old days of traditional publishing for three to five books before things really took off. And that is not all that different. I remember it was uh, Bella Andre, Barbara Freethy, Tina Folsom, and they were like the three queens of, of just superstar success in the very early days, right? Like the forerunners. And, and the same thing was true with them. It wasn't until the third or fourth book in the series that things really started to take hold. And I know that's not easy. It's not easy to go, yeah, but but Wool, Hugh Howey's blockbuster success was his 10th novel. Joe, how long your podcast uh, celebrated? Well, you're going on 11 years now? Yeah, so, yeah this yeah. is year 12. Is this year 12? Yeah. So, but it... it in the first two, one or two years of every, and I know it wasn't every weekly at the beginning, but you, you kept at it, you kept at it, you kept at it. You only hear about the success stories of the people who didn't give up, mm-hmm. right? And that's the real, it's, it's falling down eight times and getting up nine. So persistence and belief in yourself. And, and again, the other thing, and I know you talk about this a lot and I'm inspired by you from it is, is, is that com- comparisonitis is compare yourself to where you were. Oh, I didn't have a book last year. Now I have a book. Sweet. Awesome. Most people will never write a book in their lives. That is celebrate it. Take the time to celebrate it, but also take the time to keep going, to keep working at it and, and to recognize you've put something out that only you can write. You, you're the only person who could ever have shared that exact same book the way you did. And there is probably someone out there and hopefully lots of someone's where that's going to resonate uh, with them. And it, it's really hard to, to talk to well, We're in a pandemic and I talk about the long term. It's like we're mm-hmm. just such short sighted. It's like, you know, when do I get to hug people again? Well, how about let's <laughs> let's let's get the vaccinations and then, Mark, you can touch as many people as you want. But like it, we are inherently s- very uh, focused on the here and now. And that's a really, really hard thing to do. So, you know, pick up meditation, take some meditation, relax. A little less coffee, a little more water. <laughs> the, the, yeah, and, and be a relaxed wide for the win. Be author. A relaxed author, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, the book is called Wide for the Win. So where can authors find the book and also more help for going wide? Well, I like to send people to books to read.com slash wide for the win. You can also go to marklesley.ca and find links to everything from, from me right there. And obviously, uh, draft to digital.com if you're looking for uh, a great way to uh, have a free way of getting uh, ebooks made and distributed. And the Wide Plug for the Win Facebook group, we should make Oh my God, we forgot the Wide for the Win Facebook group. Yes. Which is fantastic and is full of people sharing a lot of detail and encouragement as well, I think, along the way, which is really important. That's critical because you have to recognize you're not in it alone. And there's a lot of other people who are going through the exact same thing. And the Wide for the Win Facebook group is such a beautiful community of supportive people. I cheer on uh, people's wins. And I don't, in in my mind, uh, I I actually prefer cheering on the wins. Like, Oh, my God, I, I got my first sale in this country or on this platform. Sweet. 
like, wow, I, I, I remember what that was like. And I, I feel for you because there's certain countries I haven't sold in yet, too. So that community is so critical, especially when you're feeling alone and frustrated. You're like, oh, my God, this is never going to work. Guess what? There's thousands of others out there like you. You can hang out together and, and relax together, right? <laughs> All right. Well, thanks so much for your time, Mark. That was great. Thanks, Joe. Always great to chat with you. So I hope you enjoyed the interview with Mark today and then it has given you some ideas around publishing and also for thinking long term about your author career. So coming up this week, I have a little in between episode. I'm sharing a chapter from How to Make a Living with Your Writing, the third edition, out now on every audio platform. I narrated the audiobook, so I hope you find it useful. It's definitely full of tips to help you make more money as an author. And even if you have read or listened to the previous edition, this will give you more ideas. And seriously, if you make it through the book without getting any ideas, email me and let me know and I will refund you. <laughs> for whatever you bought because I learned a lot in writing it and it is truly a new edition of uh, of how to make a living with your writing so that is coming up in the middle of the week and in next Monday's show I'm talking about mind management not time management with David Cadavy and how to reframe productivity in a way you might not expect so happy writing and I'll see you next time thanks for listening today I hope you found it helpful You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time.